Today, we are going to be talking about one of the most jaw-dropping gigs in the military, flying off and landing on the deck of an aircraft carrier. Basically, it's like threading a needle while riding a rocket, only the needle's moving, and so is the thread. These carriers might be giants on the seas, but the decks feel more like a postage stamp when you're hurtling towards it at breakneck speed. And that's not all. Ever wonder what it's like to catapult off a deck using steam or electromagnetic power, or what goes into a perfect landing that doesn't end in a splash? Or maybe you're curious about the cool tech and tweaks, like the polycore arresting wires and high-tech landing systems that keep these pilots and their birds safe and sound. And of course, we can't forget about the unsung heroes on the deck, choreographing this high-stakes ballet of flying machines. This is not just about flying. It's about mastering an environment where every second counts and every detail matters. What are the secrets behind the thrilling, adrenaline-fueled world of naval aviation? What kinds of special skills, technology, and teamwork fuel these awe-inspiring operations? Let's dive in. Fighter pilots have some of the most prestigious jobs in the military, for good reason. All pilots are commissioned officers in the United States Navy, although not all of them actually fly fighter aircraft onto and off of carrier decks. The Navy also has helicopter pilots based on smaller ships. Some pilots are based on land through a naval air station. In all, the United States Navy flies about as much as the Air Force, showing how important aviation is to its operations. For eligibility, would-be pilots must be between the ages of 19 and 26 to start, although naval pilots typically spend 20 years in the service with an 8-year active duty expectation. They must be between 5'2 and 6'5 in height, weighing between 103 and 245 pounds, have US citizenship, and pass medical screening. Vision must be corrected to 2020. Waivers are available should a candidate fail to meet one of these conditions. All naval pilots are commissioned officers and therefore must have a four-year university degree to be eligible for training. All would-be US Navy aviators first attend the Officer Training School in Newport, Rhode Island, where they attend a 13-week course. Successful completion of this course means official commissioning into the service as an officer. Officers must then achieve a score of at least 35 on the Aviation Selection Test Battery to proceed with their training. Would-be pilots have three, and only three, attempts to get the necessary score. If successful, they then attend the Air Introduction course in Pensacola, Florida. They are not flying planes there, but rather learn about basic aerodynamics, aircraft functionality, the effect of weather on aircraft, and air-to-air -air communications. The course is usually six weeks long. If candidates pass that, they move on to a flight school either in the same city or in Corpus Christi, Texas. This regimen is far more demanding. For example, new pilots must work on the T-6B Texan II training aircraft. It's a 1,100-horsepower plane that no civilian would ever start flight training on, but wannabe naval aviators must be able to fly this plane alone with only 20 hours of total flight training. As one can see, pilots learn all the ins and outs of flight in this course, including flying in military formation. If they succeed here, they must choose whether to specialize in jet, maritime, helicopter, or E2C2 flight. Those who specialize in jets will need to receive further instruction on the T-45 Goshawk, a twin-seat plane designed for naval aviators in their intermediate and advanced training stages. This is the phase when pilots learn how to take off and land on carriers. The Goshawk became the standard trainer in 1991, and its latest version, the T-45C, is built around a digital cockpit compared to the T-45A's analog one. The plane has an empty weight of around 9,394 pounds and a maximum takeoff weight of 13,500 pounds. Its airspeed is 645 miles per hour. Although these attributes are significantly less than carrier jets like the F 35C and the F A 18 Super Hornet, it is sufficient to meet the Navy's needs to train its aviators in all aspects of carrier flight. The Navy is looking for a replacement as of 2024, but this will take some time. Although the course is rigorous, the rewards are considerable. Aside from the social prestige, a typical naval pilot can earn a starting salary of $60,000 per year with an additional $20,000 housing allowance, which is much higher than most salaries in the military. Experienced pilots with years under their belts might earn six-figure salaries in addition to housing allowances. Before taking off from a carrier, pilots will get a briefing from the air traffic controllers on the ship's tower. This information will include up-to-date data on the surrounding winds and other necessary factors that will affect the procedure. 
If everything is go, the plane will taxi to the carrier's bow, where it will be hooked to the catapult, which will launch it off the other end of the deck. Nimitz-class carriers use a steam-based catapult, while the USS Gerald R. Ford and its coming sister ships use an easier-to-maintain electromagnetic catapult. The intensity of the procedure doesn't end once the plane is airborne, however. Pilots will need to climb from the deck's altitude to a safe one, taking account of environmental conditions to ensure that their missions are successful. The particular complexity of landing on an aircraft carrier and the risks of things going wrong make us understand why the training program is so rigorous. All procedures must work seamlessly for the safety of both the pilots and the flight deck crew. Landing on an aircraft carrier might seem counterintuitive because pilots are trained to speed up rather than slow down. The approach will begin at the carrier's rear from a trajectory that will allow the controllers in the tower to monitor the descent. The aircraft should be going full throttle as it lands on the flight deck. If a landing is successful, the pilot will catch one of the arresting wires on the carrier deck with the tail hook installed on the back of his or her plane. The tail hook of the naval plane can be raised and lowered like the rest of the landing gear. It's designed to be robust and capable of handling the forces involved in the operation. Once the tail hook catches the arresting wire, the latter acts as a powerful brake and brings the plane to a stop. Contact between a tail hook and an arresting cable should happen just before the landing gear makes contact with the deck. In the case of a successful landing, the pilot will disengage the tail hook from the arresting wire, taxi the aircraft to a secure location on the flight deck, and leave room for the other planes to land on the runway. Once taxied, the pilot can leave the aircraft and get some probably well-earned R&R after a mission briefing. The traditional aircraft carrier arresting wires are made of high tensile steel. The cables are attached at both of their ends to hydraulic cylinders below the deck. Once the plane's tail hook catches an arresting wire, it's dragged out. The energy is transferred to the cylinders, which absorb it and bring the plane to a halt. The arresting wires on a modern carrier can theoretically absorb up to 47.5 million foot-pounds of force. Earlier aircraft carriers weren't as robust, as their wires were attached to sandbags, which made snaps more common. Most Nimitz-class carriers have four arresting wires, each placed 50 feet apart, allowing room for error in a carrier landing by providing a pilot with multiple options. Optimally, pilots will want to trip the third wire, as it makes for the safest landing. The first wire is the most dangerous and least preferred, as it's close to the edge of the flight deck. Pilots coming in too low for the first wire can wind up crashing into the ship's stern. Wires 2 and 4 are both safer than the first, however tripping the third wire is considered proper form by naval aviators. To be seen as a skilled pilot worthy of promotion, pilots must catch the third wire on a consistent basis. The last two Nimitz-class carriers, the USS Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, and the Ford-class carriers only have three arresting wires. Why is this? The hydraulic equipment needed to hook up to the arresting wires is expensive, therefore having only three wires instead of four helped to reduce costs. However, the Navy didn't cut corners on safety in an effort to reduce expenditures. Instead, a number of improvements were made in order to make this transition a safe one. First, the newest carriers in the fleet have polycore rather than steel cables. Polycore is a composite material made of a polythylene core bounded between two layers of high tensile, strong, and flexible aluminium. Polycore is also more durable than traditional steel, as it's more resistant to rust, corrosion, denting, and the other harms that come from exposure to the elements and general wear and tear. As a result, the new polycore wires are less prone to snapping. In the new three-wire design, the number two wire has replaced the third wire as the pilot's preferred landing option. Additionally, the newest of America's carriers have an improved Fresnel Lens optical landing system, which naval personnel simply call the Lens. These are twice as sensitive as the lens systems seen on the earlier Nimitz-class carriers, and pilots can now accurately reference them from a mile away, which ensures they have better guidance and control of the glide slope. As a result, catching the preferred wire is far easier on the newer carriers, and it was another reason why the Navy decided that going down from four wires to three would not sacrifice safety. While snaps of the arresting wires are rare, they aren't unheard of, especially if they are not properly maintained. In 2016, an EC-2 Hawkeye attempting to land on the USS George Washington snapped the carrier's number four arresting wire, which swung across the flight deck, impacting and injuring eight sailors. The plane, meanwhile, fell dangerously off the carrier's edge, but was fortunately able to get airborne again before hitting the water. The naval jargon for an incident like this, when the incoming aircraft cannot for some reason make a proper tailhook landing, is the word bolter. 
That incident reveals the reason why pilots are trained to come in for landing at full throttle. If they cannot make the landing on the first go, they will have enough velocity to fly off the other end of the deck and get airborne again. Once in the sky, the pilot can circle around and make a second attempt at a landing once things on the deck are clear. Should a pilot fail to keep a plane at the necessary velocity during a failed landing, it will inevitably go over the deck and into the water. Generally, if a cable snaps, the flight deck crew will evacuate from the area. If they stick around, the wire might wind up crashing into them as it goes out of control from the snap. As you would expect, the speed, mass, and material these wires are made of will lead to nasty injuries if one of them should hit you. Footage of sailors frantically jumping over a snapping wire reveals the respect they have for this material and why the crews need to evacuate the deck until the snapped cable settles down. In addition to increasing the throttle in this maneuver, the pilot must angle the plane at an upward arc for a proper carrier landing. It will not have a catapult to assist in the takeoff, so everything falls on the pilot's shoulders. Fortunately, the angled flight deck of a modern aircraft carrier is designed for optimal, unimpeded landings. It was not always so. On older carriers, aircraft were not angled away from the runway, which meant that planes were landing right in front of other planes parked on the deck. To prevent crashes, there was a barrier in front of the parking area to separate this compartment from the runway, but this was an imperfect solution. Barrier wires were not as efficient as today's cables are, and planes would often spiral into the water. To prevent this, modern carriers are equipped with safety nets on the side of the flight deck. However, to prevent the worst-case scenario involving crew members falling into the water, flight deck personnel wear float coats. These clothes are smart as they inflate and activate flashing distress lights when they come into contact with the water. These sailors also wear special helmets known as cranials, which protect their heads and hearing. Flight deck crews also come wearing heat-resistant suits and goggles. Both of these are required to protect them from the jet engines of the carrier's aircraft. Modern carriers have also replaced the old emergency barrier. Instead, there is now a 50-foot crash barricade consisting of a series of engagement straps. The barrier resembles a net. A plane moving through this net will engage the straps, which transfer the energy to machinery below the deck, which absorbs the force. This barricade is rarely used. It's normally stowed away and only deployed in emergency situations, such as if the carrier's normal landing gear malfunctions or if the tail hook on the aircraft is damaged. This netting is strong enough to capture planes which are coming in on hard landings, and although such episodes usually leave significant damage to the aircraft and possible injuries to the pilot, both of them are at least safe. If one of the arresting wires on the carrier is broken, it's not left to lie there. The crew must replace it on the spot. This is not an easy task. Because the wire is long, about 1.5 to 2 inches thick, and made of steel or polycore, it is, as you would expect, a heavy piece of equipment. Once broken, the crew will need to assess whether the cable should be repaired or replaced. To repair a broken arresting wire, crews can try to slice it back together. Should this fail, crews will have no choice but to install a new wire to replace the broken one. Flight deck crews must also train in tasks like clearing debris from the runway and doing so quickly. If, for example, a plane's tail hook snaps during a failed landing, it must be cleared from the runway before any other planes can land. These sailors are also trained in emergency rescue procedures. If a plane falls into the water or the pilot is forced to eject, a helicopter will be sent to rescue the aviator. The sailors on the deck must also respond to various other emergencies, such as the spilling of jet fuel. Cleaning this up is an important task they will need to carry out on the fly. Broken arresting wires can also cause fires. The crew will need to react quickly and use the proper equipment to put out the flames, such as with hoses and foam. Carrying out these complicated tasks requires constant drilling by the aircraft carrier's crew. The job might not be as glamorous as those of the fighter pilots, but the latter would find their tasks impossible without the support of their highly trained comrades. Flight deck crews are continually trained in all possible scenarios, including putting out fires, providing medical care for injured sailors, preparing for emergency landings, evacuation, and how to respond in a case where the ship itself comes under attack from an enemy. To ensure smooth communication, the crew is trained in the use of specific codes and hand signals. Although one would normally think that crew members can just talk to each other, whether through in-person communication or through radio, aircraft carriers are, as you would expect, noisy. The planes and helicopters make a lot of noise, of course, but the ship is full of heavy machinery that can also make verbal communication hard. Hand signals are therefore essential to ensure the crew members can talk to each other regardless of the noise level on the carrier. 
pilots preparing to take off and land on the carrier's deck must also train in how to use and understand these hand signals. They will not only understand whether it's okay to take off or land, but the direction they should move in if they need to stop and so on. There are hand gestures to communicate more minute details as well. For example, there are signals which indicate whether an aircraft is fully fueled or not. Emergency scenarios such as a bolter come with their own specific hand signals. One of these signals indicates that the pilot needs to go full throttle and take off on the other end of the runway to make another landing. Pilots and other crew members must also be able to understand these signals at all hours of the day. At night, crew members hold glowing batons to make their hand gestures visible in the darkness, and these devices come in different colors to specify different things. Flight deck crews also have another tall task. They might need to relocate aircraft on a whim in case of an emergency. In such scenarios, aircraft will need to be removed to other parts of the deck or off the deck to prevent them from becoming casualties in case of a trajectory error, snapped cable, or some other incident. Pilots and crews must be prepared to move aircraft on a moment's notice. There are also factors beyond the control of the pilots and crew that can lead to things going wrong on a carrier. Bad weather can mean the difference between all systems being gone and getting into dangerous territory. Pilots must be trained to practice their craft in different weather and sea patterns. Pilots must therefore be able to react to the winds, which can change speed and direction in an instant, especially on the high ocean. Meanwhile, even a ship the size of a Nimitz or Ford-class carrier will wobble in rough seas. This means that the runway itself will move up and down. The ship itself is also in forward motion. Pilots will have to learn to adjust on the fly to compensate for the movement of the deck itself rather than just their planes, a phenomenon that is different from any plane taking off and landing on a runway on land. In less common but arguably worse scenarios, naval aviators must learn how to deal with engine failure on their aircraft. Such engine failure can lead to approach errors, where the pilot fails to come into the carrier deck at the appropriate trajectory thanks to mistaken speed, altitude, or direction. If all emergency scenarios are adequately handled, the crew will need to judge whether it's safe for the deck to resume normal operations. If everything is humming, a carrier's planes can be taking off and landing with only 20-second intervals between them. That everything does hum with such regularity is a testament to the skill and training of the pilots and sailors in the United States Navy. The general public often refers to America's aircraft carriers as floating cities, but these cities on the waves are also traveling theater groups. Each crew member has a specific role with highly choreographed functions that must be rehearsed repeatedly. Failure to do so will mean that the entire production will become a flop, and for an operation as delicate as an aircraft carrier, that is a disaster in the making. The training of pilots and crew is as rigorous as it is because it has to be. What do you think about America's naval aviators, and how well prepared they and their supporting crews are in the difficulty of operating an aircraft carrier? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Now go and check out Life Aboard US Navy's largest city at sea, the USS Gerald R. Ford aircraft carrier, or click this other video instead. Also make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts.